Jeff Wilson hanging out with Dennis Kang, reminiscing about uh, the last time we had an opportunity to hang out. But before we get started, those of you who don't know who Dennis Kang is, you need to know. Uh, he is a uh, former UFC fighter, former Pride fighter, trains out in um, on Microsoft's Club in, in Vancouver. An awesome guy and uh, one of the first black belts, I think, in Canada. Dennis, how are you today, my friend? I'm awesome, man. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. It's great. It's great to have you on. Uh, we were just reminiscing about uh, the last time we hung out for a couple of days. And I think it was in 2010, and we were at Saturday Night Fights. We were commentating together. It was my pleasure. It was awesome to be alongside you. Uh, and uh, and in the after party, this is a hilarious story to me, and AJ and I both remember it. We were uh, sitting at the after party, um, just a bar after the fights. And we're all sitting there, and all of a sudden, uh, it's near the end of the night, and uh, and we're all getting ready to go. And all of a sudden, this thing hits us in the face, and we don't know what's going on. Like, what? And they were like, oh, we're pepper sprayed. AJ and I run into the back, and we're getting guided by security guys. You're kind of in the periphery. And I look over, and all of a sudden, AJ are back there. Back, and it's, oh, man, how bad did you get hit? He's like this and that. They go, where's Dennis? Where's Dennis? We're looking out for you. We look outside. You're standing guard. It, it wasn't closet. that bad. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> I think that was great. That's the thing. And you, there's nothing going on with you, man. You're not crying. Your eyes are wide open. Like you're in the game. And I'm going, AJ, look at Dennis. They go, Dennis. And we're walking out after. And I go, Tennis, what, dude, doesn't, didn't it bother you? And you're like, you know how many times I've been pepper sprayed, man? It still doesn't bother me. At the all. joys of being a bouncer, <laughs> getting spat on, getting pepper sprayed. You beat someone up every now and then. That's about it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's all, it's, a, it's a glorious life, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, listen, well, I, I just, it was fun to reminisce. I was glad we could share that, but, it was uh, fun. You, you had a really cool career and you did some really awesome stuff aside, even outside of fighting. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about your time on, uh, we in dancing with the stars, correct? Yeah. 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 Let's talk a little bit about that. 2012. Yeah. 20, oh, right after that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we're trying to figure out where you were. You're like, Oh, you're back in Korea and here's the dance and dancing star. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah, that's awesome, man. It I was cool, it. man. Yeah, it, it, I tell you one thing, it was hard because I was training for a fight at the same time, right? Really? So I was, I was uh, doing like the the dance practice during the day, and then so like six seven hours a day, literally, and then I would rush off to the MMA gym and train for my fight at night, and then go back to the hotel and sleep, and then go <laughs> off and do it again, and it was hard. Yeah, they're, and then they're, they're you got to remember, this is on national television, so it's different than fighting. On like at like a stadium in Korea, you know, this is like on sent like big big TV channel in Korea. So I was very nervous. Yeah, and you're really controlled too. Your time isn't your own, really, right? No, no, you gotta get. Yeah. I mean, you, you gotta remember, like dancing is totally different. Yeah, it's very controlled. You have to count the beats of the music, right? Mm -hmm. You have to remember your steps. This whole choreography, all these complex moves and. Oh my God, it was hard. And yeah, it was hard. <laughs> well, it was as long as well, it, uh, the one thing I'm happy about is that I was not the first one to get eliminated. That's the I just told myself like I don't care how I do. I just don't want to be the first one to get kicked off. You know, and I wasn't. Thank God, I was the second one. But uh, hey, it's, it's better. It's better than being first, right? Absolutely, and uh, yeah, I, I think you've always had great footwork, but it probably actually helped eventually, right? And yeah, career. it did. It did. It was fun. They gave me a lot of lifts, like lifting up the the, the girl around. You know? Yeah, I, it gave me a whole newfound respect for dancers because these people yeah. are fit and they work hard. It is hard work, and they're really good at what they do. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's awesome. It's awesome to hear that, and uh, and I'm glad. You and you know that. what? While for that fight because of that dancing training my legs got really lean and strong because of yeah. just all the all the footwork you're doing right yeah yeah that's that's awesome uh and yeah when you think about like you can think about five to six hours but when you do it oh it's that's tough ridiculous it's yeah tough. like you, it's tough. you were standing you're on this thing we, we, we like every every new dance or choreography or episode was to one song so you're listening to that same song over and over <laughs> And over. Oh, my God. Um, 
Yeah. I'm, lo I'm lo you know what? Well, let's segue into this before we get into the choreography and and little baby Dennis Kang and, and your whole story. Music seems to have a really important part in uh, in state management in mixed martial arts. Everybody has a walkout song usually sure, that yeah. they come out to, and uh, you have the opportunity to use music in a different way as well as that. And I'm pretty sure that you wouldn't be able to walk out to the same songs you're on the Dancing with the Stars show with. But talk to me a little bit about your favorite walkout song and what it does to you mentally when you're getting ready to go out. Well, I, I mean, every fighter will tell you one of the, the most exciting and and, uh, and memorable parts of fighting is the walkout, right? Getting ready, the, the pre-fight jitters, you know, everything. It's like the, the peak, the culmination of all that training. You're just about to walk out. Everything's ready. You know, they call your name out. Everybody's cheering for you. And that music is a big part of it. That's what, I mean, I don't know about other fighters, but for me, when I would choose my own walkout music, I would listen to it on the car, in the car, on the way to the gym. And I would visualize myself over and over walking to that song. You understand? Yeah. So it, it's a big part of the of the motivation, you know? And everybody has different songs. Every Everybody has different tastes in music. Everybody has different songs that have different meanings to them, you know, what, whatever that may be. Uh, for me, it needed to be something intense that got me, you know, focused. Uh, either rap music or sometimes heavy metal. Uh, I used some Prodigy before, kind of like techno-ish. And uh, at the end, I had uh, I had a customized song made for me by a rock group in Korea called Go Super Korean, which was awesome. I used that in Pride and stuff. It was great. Yeah, that's your the, you had your own song, and that's your yeah. nickname, Super Korean. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I'll have to link to it on the show so you can hear it because I don't know if I've heard it. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's funny because uh, what I love about the anchoring process that you do when you fight and with music and when you're going to the gym is whenever you accidentally hear that song. Oh, right? it brings you right back. Yeah, I, I always tell everybody, hey, I walked out to this song and this and nobody cares. They're like, yeah, OK, another fight story from Dennis. <laughs> But to me, it means a lot, you know? Yeah, and you get into this state. This state. I remember when I went to, a, I don't know if you were uh, in town when the BC Lions had the Empire Stadium and they made it like a high school football stadium. Okay. And uh, my friend Poncho and I played football uh, in the same league uh, together right. back in the day. He said, have you been to the stadium, man? I said, no. And he said, dude, you got to go. And I go, why? He says, oh, it's, it's like football. Be back in high school. And you're like, really, why? And you walk through the tunnel as a fan. So you can imagine, like Super Bowl Sunday today, yes. you walk through the tunnel. You you just naturally you don't know. You just get the shivers again. You're like, what? Am, oh, this is like I'm going to play. You know? Yeah. So it's an amazing experience, and I love it. Thank you for sharing that. No problem, and uh, but but man, we 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 we've been friends for a while now. But let's talk about you know, baby Dennis Kang and who your parents are and how you started this journey into. Mixed martial arts. I was cloned in a laboratory. I <laughs> had to be a fighter and a secret agent. I knew it. From the I wish. I knew it. Uh, my, my, my father is Korean. My mother's French. Uh, my father worked on a commercial fishing boat and met my mother. Uh, she's from the very small French island called Saint Pierre and Miquelon. It's the two islands off the east coast of Canada, right? It's very close to Newfoundland. It's not Canadian at all, it's a French colony. So I have dual citizenship, right? It's nice. if you go there, you have to use the euro. Uh, you know, it's people speak French, French. It's the French government, French wow. municipality, blah blah blah. It's like Hawaii, you know, or Guam. It's American, but it's way out in the ocean, right? Huh. It's, it's okay. French, but it's in Canada. A lot of people don't know about it, but yeah, it's there. So I grew up. I was born there. Uh, when I was nine years old, we moved to uh, the Canary Islands, so Spain. We lived there for one year. And then we moved to Vancouver when I was about 11 years old, 10, 11 years old, and then grew up here. Yeah, you went to high school here and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So how does the relationship between you and Marco Soros start? Because, but wait, before we get to that, like there was no UFC, there was no Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You started doing Hapkido or? No, no, no. I, I, I first saw UFC. I was walking home from the from school, and I would always stop by this videotape store. 
we used to have these things called videotape store for all you millennials. And I would check out if there was any new movies. And I saw this thing called Ultimate Fighting Championship. I'm like, this can't be real. And then, it, oh, it's awesome. But the video was out. Remember, right? If somebody had taken it before you, you couldn't yeah. get it. Yeah, right? I so it. came back over like three days, three, four days. Like it was always a finally it was in. I reserved it and I, I begged my mom, can I have some money to go rent the movie? So she 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 so she gave me some money and I rented it and it was I the, my first thought was this is just like Bloodsport. This yeah, is yeah. just like Street Fighter, you know, style versus style, like the greatest thing I've ever seen, ever. UFC too, right? I love the the brutality, the whole mystery, like you didn't know what was gonna happen, you know, like because I always thought that I was always a fan of martial arts. I started martial arts when I was nine. And I always wondered, like, what's the strongest martial art? Is it Kung Fu versus Ninjitsu versus Karate versus boxing, this and this, you know? Everybody wondered that if you were in martial arts, right? So I loved it, and I didn't want to train in it first because I was only 17. I was kind of scared. Remember, back then, UFC 1, 2, 3, like the first, like, dozen UFCs, it was all, like, grandmasters, like 30 and up. There was no young guys. The first young guys was Jerry Bolander. Yeah. who was 21, and Vitor Belfort, who were 19. Love Those it. were the guys who gave me hope, right? Like, because they were my age, right? They well, made they, they, they made me think, okay, I can compete with these older dudes. Right? Oh, wow. So you thought, yeah. see, I would have thought different if I would be too old at the time, but you're like, I'm No, but back old. then, no, back then, no, no. Yeah. It was only guys who had been in martial arts for a long time. Like, at least, like early 30s late 20s you know what i mean minimum i uh i was going to tell you and you'll remember this if you've ever gone back and watched the first three blood uh blood sports the first three ufcs yeah uh there's a technique that you cannot do anymore that you and you almost destroyed uh, the ufc as a sport and it wasn't any of the gracie guys it wasn't any talented dude it was the big muscle heads that would get would bull rush a dude get full mount Grab both hands. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And headbutt, and that was yeah. like that was how everyone was winning, right? You can't and do that anymore. <laughs> Dude, I had no idea. <laughs> but you're thinking, you know, in a situation, you're like, oh, that, that almost killed the sport. So it's yeah, good. it did, it did. Um, so you get in the, you get so the I, so yeah. So I started watching it. I'm a huge fan, and then it re. I, I, like I told you, I'd done martial arts my whole life, but I'd stopped at that time when I was in high school. I'd wrestled a little bit. Um, and to be honest, I was always, like I said, I always did martial arts. I was always a very good athlete. I was good at any sport. Uh, I guess you could say I was like a star athlete in grade eight and nine, like 13, 14. And then I kind of fell off. Uh, uh, my mom was by herself with us. I started hanging out with a bad group of kids. Uh, and I always, always had remorse inside of me for having stopped sports because I saw a little bit of disappointment in my coach's eyes, you know, because I was on the team and then I wasn't. And one day he caught me smoking and I was like, oh, my God. He goes, Dennis, what are you doing? I, I crushed a cigarette in my hand, burnt a hole in my hand. Like, nothing, sir, nothing. <laughs> like it was, I was so embarrassed. I was 14, you know, smoking yeah. a cigarette. My rugby coach caught or wrestling coach caught me. And I always felt bad for that. And when I saw that, uh, like it rekindled my love of sports and martial arts and competition. And I wanted to train, right? To train and do it. And so that was always part of the driving force is that that remorse from high school of not having been able to, to reach my full potential. Anyways, so then I the only thing that there was close to me was a half keto school because they did grappling. Yeah. which was the closest thing to BJJ. So I joined that. I trained there. They were a great group of guys, Wolf, Seth, Keto. Uh, you know, I still respect them to this day. Very good school. And then uh, uh, I heard of Marcus Soros coming to town, moving from Brazil. First, it was a little too expensive for me. But then I said, you know what? Fuck it. Uh, I'm going to do it. And uh, I joined up with him. And, and then that's it, man. That was June 1st, 97. I joined up with Marcus. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and your career started really – to 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 go from there you had some man you were fighting pretty early too right like what yeah what belt were you like how uh, was your first fight? well i had my first fight in 98 i was a blue belt in in pride or in no 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 and then i my first mma fight was that here yeah in vancouver yeah it was an underground fight so talk to me about those days man i remember sitting with you at lunch uh the day before saturday night fights and looking at your hands and I was like, you mean this one? 
yeah, like all, yeah, like surgery scarred up yeah. and like bionic ish, but also through the you put them through the thing and yeah. and I was like, how long have you been really doing this? And I think at that time, and that was a long time ago. You like haven't fight like ten years and used to fight underground. How does an underground fight happen? How did that well, you know what? It was uh, the way it was was so the MMA was not legal, right? Uh, so. It was a. It was set up like a regular fight, except that, that you the only you only knew the day of where the event was going to be. You had to call a pager number. Remember what pagers was? You had to call yeah. a pager number. Someone would call you back and tell you the address of the event, and that's where it was like a rave. Remember raves? That's how raves used to happen. Yeah, but you didn't know who you're fighting, or you did. Oh, I knew who I was fighting. Yeah, yeah, oh, I knew okay. who I was fighting. Yeah, it was a guy from Seattle, just south, two hours south of here. One of Maurice Smith's students. If you remember who Maurice Smith. Oh yeah, I met Maurice. Yeah. 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 So uh, and then it was in a warehouse in East Richmond, which is a part of Vancouver. And like I said, underground location. Um, there was about five hundred people in attendance, and the police kept knocking on the door. And the promoter kept on coming in our dressing room and saying, "All right, guys, the police are here. If they ask you anything, we're just filming a movie." And then he came back. He came back twenty minutes later. All right, guys, the police are here again. If they ask you anything, it's just a wrestling tournament. So mission wrestling. We don't have cameras or lights for a movie. Yeah, and, and, then, and then our dressing room was like a little closet with a curtain, and that was both dressing rooms. And I, re I, I remember seeing the guy who fought before me just puking in the corner, just and because he fought and he lost, it was bad, man. And I was like, oh my god, what am I like? I didn't want to do that. I, go, I can't believe I'm doing this. I hope the police shut this down. Oh, the cops are here. Good, good. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I, I, I hope there's an earthquake and everything's canceled. Like a meteorite hits the roof or something, you know. And how's yeah. that first fight go? Oh, one man in like 15 seconds. <laughs> no, it was great. Yeah, and then everything changes. You're like, I'm gonna yeah. do this. Again. I ha I have it on video somewhere. I can send it to you. Uh, oh yeah, on Messenger later if you want. I gotta find it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love that. So yeah. that's your first forte into MMA. Great beginning. Yeah. And then how do the how does the call start happening to for for Japan? How many more fights you go? Well, on? I had I had a couple more fights. Uh, see, back then, I didn't know anything about being a professional athlete or training for fights. Nobody told me anything. Yeah. Absolutely starting from beyond zero, like minus 25. I didn't even know what a manager or agent was. Like, yeah. my remember John Alessio? He fought Pat Militic in UFC. Do you remember him? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah he's from Victoria. So anyway, so him and I linked up, and we decided to go to this event in Colorado called Boz Rutten Invitational. And we had to pay our own airfare, pay all this, this. I didn't know that you got paid to, to they played your airfare. I didn't know you were supposed to get your shit paid for you. Like, wow. Anyway, so we, we we went and fought. I won my first fight, lost my second fight, but the referee was this guy named John Peretti. You remember who that is? Yes. He was the matchmaker for the first UFCs, right? And he made extreme fighting. And he I go, How can I get more fights? He goes, he gave me the phone number for this lady named Phyllis Lee. R.I.P. She she died a couple years ago, but she was this older lady. About she looked like a grandma, like at seventy five. You can Google her. She was like, as she was an ex pro wrestler in the eighties and seventies, really? and then by that time she was in her sixties. She walked with two canes, but she knew the business. Remember, pro wrestling and MMA were very very intricately linked somehow yeah. you know because they were yeah. it was just show fighting right it was some some kind of showbiz so she had connections in japan and she had an exclusive booking agreement with pancreas in japan so yeah. she said all right kiddo you send me your material your pictures <laughs> topless pictures uh video <laughs> highlight and i'm like oh it's kind of weird but whatever and but she was super nice man she's a uh, phyllis lee man she managed nate markart she was managing uh uh, Shoney Carter, all these guys, man. She uh, made talk. a lot of guys' career. Like she, she, she managed Dan Severn. Remember him? Yeah, yeah. She, you can see her in a, in a couple of UFCs when Dan Severn walks out. A lady with glasses with the chains. Like that's how old she is. She had chain glasses. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, like a granny. Yeah, Can't yeah, yeah, my yeah. glasses. Anyways, uh, so yeah, so she got me the call to go fight in Japan, and I fought Minoru Suzuki, who is like. One of the founders of Pancrase, the god of Pancrase, my hero, and I'm fighting him. And I'm like, I know I'm I'm, I'm being brought over there to lose. I'm yeah. over there in my little red speedos. The fight is online on YouTube, and I beat him. I knocked him out or TKO'd him, and it was great. 
oh my god, I was 22 years old fighting in Japan with Marcus, just a dumb young kid, like looking around all, all wide eyed, you know, it was amazing. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. And then you go on this this <laughs> crazy tear, and we I remember we were watching uh, you on Pride and in, in that sixteen win streak, man. Mm -hmm. You were just it was like you were fighting all the time and yeah. always winning. There was one year where I fought seven times. I was six and one that year. Yeah, two thousand four yeah. or three. It was the highest level competition like that first yeah. win must have been amazing to yeah. to come through and do that and then and then as you start to continue to go through and your role and everything good's happening then there's some things that you know as it happens in almost everybody's life or everybody's sort of journey and whatever they're doing comes obstacles whether they be personal challenges or a torn bicep right yeah yeah and so how does that how do obstacles in your way to your your success uh how do they how do they get there and then how do you Man, you, it, it happens. You just deal with it, man. You got no choice than to deal with it. You know what I mean? You pull through. Like people persevere. You yeah. know, the torn biceps suck, but I mean, I, I moved on, and, and you know, I had fights after that. Yeah, and it was fun, you know. And then I ended up tearing my other bicep a couple of years later. <laughs> That's crazy. I I them, but I'm still, I still got the guns, baby. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, That's crazy. I, I, Jesse Bongfeld. Uh, I interviewed last year. Oh yeah, at a Canoria, and he had he tore his one bicep, and a year to the day he tore his other bicep. Yeah, that's, that's right. crazy. What? How did you do it? Just so I want to see the first series. one. Well, training training. both of them was throwing hooks. So the first one I tore it in pride, exactly one, how it the right hook to the body, and in yeah. the left one I was throwing a left hook to the liver. But but the right one I never had it reattached, so it's still I have a hole in my bicep. It looks like. The left one, it tore off completely, and I had to have it surgically retached. Wow. In Montreal, yeah. This was in sparring, the left one, and it was bad. Like, it felt like an elastic snapping and then boom, just rolling up the bicep. So they literally had to cut my bicep open, reach inside with pincers, and then pull the bicep back down, screw it in to the bottom, latch it down like a tent pole. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good analogy, yeah. right? <laughs> that is, yeah. No, I, I got to learn by analogies because I, I start blacking out when I start hearing. Oh, really? Surgery. No, no. It's, I just had a hip surgery last year, just so you know. I got a titanium hip. You got your hip replaced? Yeah, full, oh, full wow. replacement. Man, I, I, I was almost in a wheelchair. No, sorry, not last year. The year before, June. The yeah. super Koreans almost bionic now, hey? Because oh, the new God. hip's great, isn't it? Yeah, I've had four, five six seven eight surgeries total wow yeah. and you're still kicking and throwing down and hitting the bag when no one else is oh, in the as soon as well before the surgery I, the hip surgery i was almost in a wheelchair or crutches man it was so bad like i would always say if there was a tiger chasing me even on adrenaline i wouldn't be able to run like yeah possible i could only stand for maybe like two minutes and then i had to sit down and now that i have i had the hip done um, i could fight again if i wanted to it's amazing. yeah yeah yeah. Thanks. i had a friend who had that done as well and and everybody advises me if you ever are especially for strong strong kickers yeah you, you're always gonna have a little bit worse hips right just yeah because it's because of the way you stand too you always put more emphasis on one hip mm -hmm. right yeah but uh but I didn't realize how they did that surgery. I didn't realize they took your whole leg off and put it right back oh on. Oh, my God. Have like, you seen it on YouTube? They literally <laughs> slice you open, take your femur out. It's like, remember having G.I. Joe's or Masters of the Universe, the kid, the legs? Yes. It's, it's the hip and socket, right? It's the bowl uh, where the, the leg goes in. So they take it out, saw off the head of the femur, and then put a – it's like a mushroom cap made of titanium. And then – but like, let's say this is the femur. So they stick the mushroom head on and they got to hammer it in. So they're sitting there, bang, <laughs> like hammering a, a nail, a, a rail spike on a train track. You know what I mean? Go watch yeah. it on YouTube. You'll probably well, pass I'm it. not going to. Once again, I just told you how much I hate talking about this and you love talking about it. I'm like, and that, imagine this is, the, this is my femur. They stick it in and they got to hammer it. There you go. <laughs> If you have ketchup there, I'm gonna pass out, and you're gonna finish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, man, that's awesome. Uh, good to see, man. And and so, do you still get that? I, mean, I don't know if you ever formally retired, guys. Like you never I did. Really well, well, I I did. I mean, I never announced. I don't. Yeah. I don't believe in announcing it. I don't care. But yeah. I just no. I 
I, I do. I don't get the itch to, to train for a fight. Yeah. Right? It's kind of, I don't know. So not really. I don't know. But it's just really passing know. it on now. And, and now you're, 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 you're at, you've always been Marcus's guy and working with the, the guys in Vancouver. But then other opportunities start coming up, right? Uh, yeah. Like, what do you yeah, mean? Like, Dancing with the Stars. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was, that was in 2012. Uh, I did that. And then uh, I, I was doing a lot of stuff in Korea. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, now the, 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 my gig with UFC Gym right now is – right now is the best thing that i got going on man it was a great opportunity because it's it's um it's it's in my mind it's the next best thing to working with the ufc itself i mean i'm 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 involved in mma all day every day and i'm with a, a, a big company you know with yeah. a, a large well, let's, corporation let's plug the ufc here for a bit in the gym because one of the things that i've noticed and and is that guys that are starting to work from the UFC gym and what I'd like to see the UFC gyms do is bridge that gap between competitor to fighter and get into the Institute and actually yeah. go train there. Sure. Because if you guys can do that there, man, that is the one huge yeah. selling. No, we can, we can do that. We can do that. I still have a strong relationship with the UFC with, with Dana and Sean Shelby, yeah. you know, my dream is still to have to make, get a guy all the way to the UFC if possible, you know? So, Oh yeah. Well, I mean, you got guys there. And BJ was just uh, hanging BJ out. BJ was just yeah. here, man. Yeah. How was that? Uh, oh, it was amazing. Know. It was amazing. Such a cool guy. I mean, I, him and I, you know, we know each other from way back, just from from the fighting circuit. But it was just he's such a good, humble guy, and everybody loved having him here. We he showed an awesome seminar, and you know, it, it was great. Yeah, he's still uh, it, it, our good friend AJ Scales. Uh, you know. Uh, champion world champion yeah. in, in uh, black belt masters this year last year and uh or 2017 um world champion uh and you are really good friends you called him out uh yeah. to help train when you fought uh, professor x yeah. and uh and you won that fight which is amazing yeah. um but uh he said and he's let's let's be honest he fights for 185 but he's probably two two ten to two two oh five right now and he rolled with bj and, uh, when we went to the we went to the Drake concert, when he came down, he was hanging out with you, and he said, "I said, what was it like, you know, rolling with it, with BJ? You uh, you have quite a few pounds on him," and he's like, "He didn't even want to talk about it, man." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man, he's he's good. He won, you know, BJ's BJ's got a lot of experience. Yeah, and he just and guys like you and guys like BJ when they when they decide you know they're going to control you on the ground doesn't matter your weight doesn't matter yeah. what's going on you're yeah. you're just done so yeah. that's cool that you guys have the opportunity uh, to work together there and I know I talked to um, one of the guys over at the UFC gym so I'm glad that that's happening right now but let me talk uh, a little bit about uh, supplementation and then um pre-fight post-fight meals like now that you've gone through not even having a manager to not even knowing how to train to building a system that no that you know works you know um talk to me a little bit about that like when, when you're getting new guys in and you now have the gift of the wisdom that you have and you're now putting them through the training which is the most important part mm -hmm. and then do you, do you talk to them about diet and supplementation now um a little bit you know what it, there's so much information out there right now most guys already know quite a bit it's rare that you have a guy who who who, who doesn't know like it's so easy to do your research themselves your the research yourself you know or just on diet and you go on forums and everybody watches ultimate fighter blah 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 you get a lot of, of, of information just from that you know yeah um I know for a fact that that and it's it's usually individualized to the person, right? You almost yeah. A lot, well, there's a lot of new supplements, but a lot of people now are eating more organic. Uh, nobody cared about that back in the day. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people eat organic. A lot of vegetarians now. Uh, you know, a lot of people eating paleo or whatever, however you want to call it. You know, a lot of people doing intermittent fasting, right? Yeah. There's there's all these fads, and you got to find the right one for you. You know, yeah. they all work. Right, they yeah. all they all work if you do it consistently and tweak to your, you know, to your body type. Yeah, it's almost like a, it now you have all this information. People are like, oh no, the the fastest way to get anywhere is a straight line. You're like, you know what? Sure, all humans are 99% same genetically, yeah. but that one percent, there's probably about 10 variables that affect yeah. who That's you right. are. 
you are. And so right. you got to experiment with those in order to to get that done. Um, yeah. What about fights and, and car bloating, anything like that? Like, I mean, dieting is always this. What about what? Sorry. I was thinking about, so uh, I'll always carb load before I know that I have to uh, oh, yeah. of energy and that type of thing. But um, through the process of dieting, you can't really carb load, right? Yeah, well, you got to remember, like, because we, we got to, we got we, we got to cut weight right so it's almost like a modified carb loading because you're depleting yourself to make that weight once you make the weight you're replenishing yourself as much as possible so it's a type of loading you know you're eating carbs and and getting a lot of water the one thing i would do different is the way i used to do it is i would cut, make the weight and then after my my, my pre-fight meal, like the night the night of the weigh-ins, the night before the fight, I would always have pizza and pasta. I wouldn't do that anymore. I would be a lot healthier, you know? I would stick to like maybe just more sweet potatoes and greens, things that are a lot more alkaline for the body, knowing yeah. what I don't know. But back yeah. then, I didn't really know about anything any other way, you know? Yeah, so. that, would increase, that would allow your digestive system not to overexert itself. So exactly, you exactly. And I, I don't think it was that bad, but it just could have been better. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, and I, yeah, because I would put on quite a bit of weight, and I would feel heavy, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, cool. I, I mean, I know you're busy here. I know you got to get going, and I appreciate you taking the time. But I want to ask two questions that are kind of both okay. out way out here. Uh, the first one is um, is going to be what's the greatest lesson um, you learned from your family um, when you look back at it that's guided you through. Um, you know, times in your life when you needed guidance. One thing uh, I remember my father teaching me or telling me is to always work hard and always put in a little extra. Now, he didn't tell me this in terms of, of training for sports, but he was, he was telling me this, like he said, when you're working, when you have a job, always stay do a little bit extra, always work hard, you know, that that Asian hard work mentality, go a little over what's expected of you, you know? And I always I always put that towards my training in in MMA, you know? Always do a little bit extra than the next guy, just because that's that's what's gonna separate you from the rest, you know? Yeah. And what would that, um, I love it, thank you for sharing that. What would that, do, what would that show itself up as, like another 15 minutes? Because, man, I remember being down. Just do extra or, drills, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. like, for example, you have a lot of, everybody shows up to spar at the same time, right? We spar, we do five rounds, blah, 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 and then everybody's done. They, they chill, they talk, it's a good boys, boys club, you know? Uh-uh, I'm, I'm sitting there, I do extra drills, yeah. you know what I mean? Rep, rep technique out. Yeah. Right. I also, I also remember being uh, was it t t uh, at the Muay Thai gym in Vancouver downstairs in the basement. Was it church basement? I can't remember. No, no, no. It was it was the Muay Thai gym basement. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It me, you, Bill Mahood. I think Jimmy was there and a bunch of other guys. And uh, your workouts aren't easy, man. I mean, your warm ups. Yeah. I was tired after the warm up. I was like, oh man. And you yeah. just got this look in your eye, like we haven't even started. And I'm like drinking water. Yeah, that back back then, man, that, that little dungeon, that's what I called it. Yeah. I killed it, man. Like we were training hard. No windows. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody was just sweating, man. It was a warrior's warrior's cave in there. Yeah, it was. Uh, it, I mean, I, I was in awe seeing everybody that was down there, and, yeah. and uh, it was great to be there. Um, but here's another thing: like you have the 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 what's it, the gift of oversight now, having an incredible career yourself and being a gifted athlete, and then having opportunities outside, sort of like Din Thomas doing his acting here on TV right. in Korea and in the Super Korean, which is amazing. So you have really cool things, but looking back now, aside from changing your your pre-fight meal. What would be three of the things, like three things that you would tell up and coming guys that want to get to the UFC, three things that you wish you knew when you first came out or two things or five things, whatever. It was probably a list of a hundred, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess it depends on who you're talking to, too. No, I, I know, I know. But, but still, if they're for young guys, young guys fighting and competing, um, one thing that I realized, I've coached, I've cornered people from the lowest level all the way up to a UFC title fight. 
I, I, I cornered uh, Jeff Munson when he fought Tim Sylvia. I cornered guys all the way in UFC. And when I cornered, I helped George fight uh, Jake Shields. I helped Rory against uh, Nate Diaz. One thing I learned is that everybody feels the same thing, the same nerves, no matter your level. You're sitting there at the wings watching everybody. Is that my opponent? Am I fighting this guy? He looks big. He doesn't look nervous. He looks nervous. This and this. He looks big. His arms look big. You know what I mean? Am I ready? Am I this and this? Everybody goes through the same things, right? Everybody doubts themselves. Everybody, you know, uh, demonizes their opponent and strengthens them in, in, in their head, you know? You can't think, you, you can't, like, uh, and a lot of people also kind of, mentally separate themselves from the pack by saying oh my god i'm nervous he's not nervous i'm feeling this he's not feeling that uh they're feeling the exact same thing just accept that you're going to be nervous and everybody's nervous and go along with it and that's it you know so no matter so, yeah realize yeah. that yeah this is th what you're feeling is what everybody else everybody feels, feels it man and then it doesn't stop you you just know that no you just keep going it's yeah, like yeah. i always say it's like going to the dentist when you're a kid right you hate it but you, your parents take you you're like all right you gotta go you're just stuck for the ride right yeah but you're gonna lose all your teeth or you're gonna get yeah. a brain infection That's if you don't it. get the, in, 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 inflammation down or whatever. Yeah, yeah i get it what else um don't train smart not that like train hard but train smart as well you know what i mean don't forget the rep out technique a lot of people one thing that i always did is i always tried to make myself better every fight that i would come right so always learn new technique and learn to apply new moves a lot of people they learn new moves but they don't apply them in sparring and live training. Back to old ways, they don't. Yeah, work. exactly. Like when they they like they spar completely different than they practice. Mm -hmm. You understand? So yeah. if you learn a new move, a new takedown, a new combination, like make yourself use it in practice, even though it's not gonna work at first. But you have to keep use. It's not supposed to work right away because it's new. You have to get the timing. You have to tweak it and make it your own. Right? Whatever you work. Whatever you learn, it's it's you're learning it from someone else who has a different body type than you. So you have to you know you have to modify it according yeah. to your body type. Yeah, right? fail faster. Yeah, this is a game of of inches, right? So right. never stop learning down yeah. to the smallest details. Never just be like, oh yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. Do the double leg like this or the punch like this or like this. No, no, it's not the same thing. There's a lot of details, man, that make a huge difference. You have to be a fan of the sport and always be doing your homework. Yeah, you know what? You're so right. When uh, BJ and AJ were in Owen in Calgary for Aldo's fight, BJ was talking to uh, Daniel Cormier. AJ standing beside him. I don't know if he told you the story, but mm -hmm. he basically says, "How do I beat George's uh, double leg?" He says, "Nobody, you can't beat it." And he goes, "Yeah." And he goes, and and BJ goes, "That's because he puts his head on this side, and he's too quick. You can't get his neck." And so. BJ says AJ, so AJ goes to shoot on on uh, Daniel. Daniel's like, oh, oh, hit AJ <laughs> on the UFC butts going to the fight. So dude, these guys are going to the event. Yeah, oh, I gotta ask this question. I haven't got a good answer yet. So you're absolutely right, man. And even at the highest highest levels, those guys are continuing to to learn and get better. Uh, I yeah. love it. That's right, right? Yeah, yeah. Is there a specific absolutely. time? Is there a specific time you remember with that? had an effect in your career or in, a, in somebody you're training with? Which one? Just innovation and, and making sure you used a new technique and, and why? Um, for one of my, my uh, in my opinion, my best fight, my uh, fourth or fifth fight in Pride when I fought Amar Suluev, um, I was, uh, the, the way that I trained, I trained hard for that fight. I was in good shape, but... I remember on the day before leaving, for, I was an American top team at the time. On the day leaving for that fight, I wanted to. I decided to do a little bit of a light shadow sparring with small gloves with my one of my training partners, George Santiago, and I wanted him to mimic my opponent. And then I remember, for some reason, when when I was uh, fighting a week later, and I'm actually like squaring up with this guy, Amar Sulev. I remember thinking, man, he's way slower, way different than than uh, than George that I was. You know, the last guy that I trained with uh, yeah. in Florida, you know. So just little things like that that you got to get used to. So know? when you realized he was slower, what was what, what happens then? When uh, I felt, no, it's not that he was slower. I just felt like he was, I was just seeing it faster. 
for some uh, reason. Yeah, cool. because so, I'd gotten my opponent. To, uh, sorry, I'd gotten my my sparring partner to mimic him and to do it even better than he was doing it. And I was like, yeah. oh man, like I think in my head I'd, I'd somehow just you know kind of like made him stronger than he really was or i don't know it, that was the perception anyways and then when i was really in the ring with him i was like oh man this guy he's way slower than i thought or you know like my yeah. thought i remember my thought exactly was this is totally easier than sparring <laughs> like that's what i thought <laughs> yeah and, you know, and i beat him i killed him kudos to you because yeah kudos to you because you've always brought people in to mimic guys you're gonna fight and most of the time yeah. those guys are really good yeah yeah, so I think that's a real good secret uh, as well, and that's great. Anything else that you would that you would uh, advise new guys coming up? Save your money, man. So at one point, if you sometimes when you get big, when you it's it's a certain certain points in a career, if you make it to like a, a level where you're getting endorsements and things outside of fighting, there's certain part times where it seems like money is just always coming in you're getting a, an endorsement check from this or this person calls and offers you this and it just seems like it's going to come forever but it doesn't yeah you know invest in an accountant and in yeah. some kind of money management person or learn about it anyways yeah. right that's what i did it's very important man uh dennis i i absolutely uh am so happy to reconnect and i get up there and see you at the gym uh in the next couple of months and uh i really appreciate you taking the time so what i heard is always be learning always do something extra and uh and and uh, be more uh f frugal By that's right or no, not necessarily <laughs> frugal invest Same something. just me right be smart yeah. with your money right yeah yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time, my friend. Uh, we'll send this out to you uh, before. My pleasure. Out and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. But great to see you and we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thank, thank you, you, Jeff. Bye for now. Yeah.